good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome you all to the public lecture organized by mechanical engineer sectional committee of isa today we are going to have a public lecture on 5g cellular cellular telecommunication technology our veteran uh, present is here dr shamila paturi from uh, mobitel and uh, i welcome you all and dr shamila paturi you may wonder that uh, as a mechanical engineers why we are organizing uh, this uh, lecture of 5g purely on telecommunication technology but uh, during uh, uh, last maybe 100 200 years we have seen technology transformations like uh, industrial revolutions now the phase of industrial revolutions are becoming short earlier we had revolutions in uh, about once in 100 or 200 years but now it is the life is become shorter the phase is now about 10 years maybe 15 years we see a drastic technology change or revolution there are a lot of rumors are going on about uh, this new technology and uh, in the international level also usa and uh, china is also having dispute especially the huawei company usa is uh, uh, imposing some sanctions or restraints on huawei in usa uh, if you think of the idea behind behind that uh, i got to know but uh, this new technology uh, will be having a income target of more than maybe 500 billion a uh, doctor will explain more detail about that with that i would like to introduce a lecturer today dr shamil apathuri has over two decades of experience in tele telecommunication and ict field he is currently leading mobitel private limited network network strategy and transformations and he is an advisor and lecturer at the sri lanka technology campus sltc he was formerly a design and development consultant at british telecommunication plc in the uk he was also post graduate research fellow at university college london dr shamil has received many awards and scholarships based on his research in telecommunications including winning the institute of engineers engineering and technology annual innovations in engineering award in 2007 He also led consortium of researchers in Germany, Belgium, Ireland and the UK in the project funded by the European Union on developing long reach passive optical networks. He has also authored or co-authored over 20 publications in international conferences and peer reviewed journals. With this I would like to invite Dr. Shamil Apathure to the stage. Good evening everyone. Thank you all for being here. It's a privilege and an honor to be invited by the IESA to speak on 5G. Uh in my family certainly giving a lecture at 5G is the be all and end all. So everyone at home is celebrating the fact that I'm doing this and I'm also very honored to be here. Um I just want to give you a little brief about what I'm going to talk about. Obviously it's a, the topic is 5G. but my uh, what i hope to do is to actually give you a little bit about the basics and something about the changing role of an engineer who would work on 5g and uh, finally a little bit about the business case so moving on swiftly so the first thing is 5g and uh, i put this slide up because it says that what i think 5g is may be very different to what you think it is it's taken from a movie the princess bride and what the the intention i put this slide up is not to streamline your thinking into what i say 5g is your version of 5g is absolutely correct if you think 5g does this then that is true 
and what I want you to do is to keep working along those lines to make sure your version of 5G becomes a reality because the truth is 5G is all encompassing. So what I say today is not the only way 5G can be done. Whatever your creative juices lead you to do, please pursue it. Okay. So that's the first point I wanted to make. And uh, before we, uh, and also I just wanted to say the the uh, the my presentation will have three main bits. I like to call them the three Bs. The first will be the background and the basics. Uh, the second will be the boring bits. Unfortunately, I have to go through it. And the third is the business. So the business side of it is what most people are interested in. And I hope the flow of this talk will pursue, pursue those trends. Now, the first thing is before we start on 5G, it's good to know where mobile technology started from and why we ended up here at 5G. So, uh, you know, GSM started in Sri Lanka in 1995 or so. Uh, it was launched actually by Dialog and Dialog were in fact the last mobile operator to come in. So mobile technology was in Sri Lanka even before that. From 89 we had Celtel and we had uh, Hutch and all the others who came in but they came in with analog technology. So what was it about GSM that made this so successful? In fact it was because this was standardized so the European community got together and decided every country can't do its own version of mobile communications let's get together and standardize this and with that standard it was almost like a blueprint if you follow this method you can start doing mobile communications in whichever part of the world you are and you can then get going quickly because you have the efficiencies of scale so the cost comes down when everybody starts following the plan and you don't like for example a country like Sri Lanka didn't have to start building its own handsets you know we just buy it off the shelf somebody goes abroad or companies sell it because everybody whether it's a Chinese company or an American company or whoever who's manufacturing a handset they know the standard so they know if I build a phone according to this version it will work anywhere in the world so that was the, that's a key point here and that's the reason why mobile operators today have gone on to 5G so nobody, nobody no hobby electronics guy can ever attempt to do 5G because they would be working on their own standards and it will be almost impossible to gather the scale globally to make this successful. So in Sri Lanka, these, these, uh, uh, the, this timeline is actually what happened in Sri Lanka. So we had 2G called GSM and it's standard for global, uh, global system for mobile communications. Then in 2007, Sri Lanka launched 3G, which was called UMTS, which standard for Universal Mobile Telecommunication System. Uh, 4G is LTE, which came to Sri Lanka in 2012, stands for Long Term Evolution. And 5G, uh, there isn't really a name, but I've seen it used recently called NR, which stands for New Radio. So, the telecoms industry is not very creative in their naming convention but the technology underlying that is actually very very sophisticated and that was the first point I wanted to make now if you look at this graph uh, at the bottom we have something called NBIOT which was actually launched in Sri Lanka in 2017 by Mobitel and I haven't started 5G as a trend from the bottom if you notice it's almost a continuation of 3G and 4G and that's quite important to understand here because as we go along you will understand that 5G uh, is only one component about the handset and the speeds you get on your mobile phone. A lot of it is very different and we'll move on to that straight away. So one thing I want to tell you is as uh, engineers we like to organize our thoughts in a structured format. So we like block diagrams and layers. And this is an architecture that I like to use when I describe what mobile communications is all about. Uh, if there are f five layers, the bottom is called user equipment, which obviously stands for the handsets and devices that you use. The second is called the bearer network. And this is where telco operators in Sri Lanka are very strong. So we started by launching 2G, then we moved to UMTS, 3G, 4G, LT. Everything is in this bearer network. In fact, at my company, over 90% of our investments have been in the network. Since 2003, Mobitel has invested over 600 million US dollars on the network. And I'd also like to say that uh, when mobiles were originally launched in Sri Lanka, the cost of a pound of bread was 3 rupees and 10 cents early, early uh, 1990s. 
and the cost of a minute of a voice call was 30 rupees. Today that has reversed. A mobile call is 1 rupee and a pound of bread is about 75 rupees. I don't know any other industry in the world, leave alone Sri Lanka, where the price of this utility has actually gone opposite to inflation, right? 30 rupees to 1 rupee as opposed to bread moving from 3 rupees 10. So it's a very exciting industry to be in, despite the fact that it, it requires a whole lot of investment. So 600 million USD is not something to be sniffed at, despite the fact that Mobitel has invested that over 15 to 16 years. And one thing we do at Mobitel is we always try to stay with the rest of the world. We are, in fact, Sri Lanka has actually been punching above its weight where we have launched 4G and now 5G even before lots of countries in the world, lots of well-established countries. So the UK have only just launched a trial 5G network, uh, Mobitel, Mobitel and even Dialog did this in April this year. So Sri Lanka is very, very technologically advanced. And we'll talk a little bit about where the business case comes into. Why do, why do telcos get into this sort of technology when it costs so much? Because as lots of people say, well, you know, get 4G working properly before you do 5G and all that. But actually, that's not the way this business works. You have to be at the cutting edge every time a new wave of technology comes in or you end up going far behind, as is the case for some operators in Sri Lanka itself. Okay? So the point is that what if you, as engineers, whatever area you work in, whether it be in software or, or hardware or devices or analytics, you name it, you will sit somewhere in one of these layers. So the entire mobile communication gamut can be described by this entire architecture. Now, I'll go very quickly here. The, the point I wanted to show you is how the complexity of this network varies over time. When we had 2G, we basically go and plant a base station somewhere uh, around the country. You've seen them, the red and white towers. That's connected to a base station controller to a switch, which then connects to the public switch network. It's a very simple architecture. With 3G, it didn't change very much. It was very much the same. Base station, BSC was replaced by an RNC, and you again connected to the internet. Now, 2G was essentially a voice dominant network. It was developed so that you could make phone calls. With 3G, they tried to bring in data so that you could access the internet on your devices. However, 3G didn't quite cut the mustard, as they say, because the speeds weren't very good, the quality wasn't great, and it was crying out for something new, which is why 4G came in, and it was a network that's designed 100% for data. In fact, voice is now just a a service on top of a data network called voice over LT, Volte as you might have heard the acronym. So the network evolved from voice to broadband to proper broadband and then now you think we've got voice and we've got data, why do we need 5G? And that's what I hope to answer today with this slide. So here's what the 4G network looks like and this is the 5G network. Now I like to call this slide a bit of the googly slide because uh, it's extremely complicated and I did that purposely to make myself look good that oh, wow, I know all about this but in fact like a googly there's only three ways the ball can spin right it can bounce from leg to off off to leg or go straight and even with mobile networks it's still the same thing you have a base station you have transmission and you have your core network which is on top which is like your brain center now 4G to 5G has it required small evolutions to get to 5G because the jump is so big that it's actually quite hard to do this 5G network overnight. In fact, there are two versions of this uh, 5G network that's available right now. Right now we have what's called a non-standalone network which basically uses the 4G network as an anchor and on top of that you build your 5G network and its capabilities over time and in fact that part is still not here you have the standalone 5g network and that hasn't even been standardized yet okay so you see the importance of standardization when i told you how gsm came in so in fact we are quite a bit ahead of the curve when we talk about 5g being deployed in all these countries because you could argue that it's not the true 5g but it's actually giving you all the services of 4g plus more and what are these services that 5g offers well, 5G, is con 5G consists of three primary pillars, okay? The first one is called enhanced mobile broadband. That is basically what all of you know on a retail level. 
which is giving you faster broadband speeds on your mobile phone. Now as operators we don't find that particularly uh, sexy if you like because 4G is actually doing the business right now. You get over 150 Mbps on your mobile phone and we don't see an application that really requires a 1 gigabit per second speed. We do it because we think uh, you always have to be ahead of the game. The more important and interesting pillars of the 5G network is massive IoT. IoT stands for Internet of Things and in 5G it's all about connecting billions of devices together not necessarily on one network not necessarily so Mobitel's network alone won't connect 5 billion IoT devices but all the networks in the world together will potentially target around 25 billion connected devices so if you think the population of the world is only 7 billion and we only have 4 billion connected even today with 5G and IoT you are actually far encompassing these connections and all this bandwidth is going to be flying around with the massive IoT or massive Internet of Things. The third pillar of 5G is a concept that's often overlooked so we always like to have fast speeds right but 5G actually offers you something called a lower latency. Now what is the latency? A latency is actually the time taken between you requesting some information and it coming to and ending up on the device that uses it. Now it need not be a device, it could be a machine to machine communication. But the point to remember is that with this lower latency, you can actually do mission critical stuff. So imagine you're doing remote surgery. So you have the best surgeon in the world who's uh, via some robotic gloves or haptic gloves is performing a live surgery over thousands of miles away on another unsuspecting patient in an operating theater. What the surgeon does here has to be mimicked in less than one millisecond over the internet on the other side. So this is what you call latency. I mean, people in the financial institutions will understand this very well. When you do stock trading, for example, whoever makes their trade in the shortest possible time actually wins out on the deal. They can make their money faster with their stock trades. And that is because the latency is lower. So 4G had a big jump. It came down to 50 milliseconds latency. 5G is actually targeting less than one millisecond latency. Now, one millisecond might not sound like a lot or it may sound like a lot, but what is very important to understand is, remember I told you the simple facts about a network. You have a base station, you have a core network, and it's connected by some form of transmission line. Today, predominantly that is fiber optics. So even the speed of light, if it has to travel around say hundreds of kilometers and go through some sort of routing equipment it adds certain milliseconds of delay you know and that delay is very very hard to achieve i mean you can't bring this latency down much lower than that and therefore they start working on concepts where the base station itself has a lot of processing power in it so you try to reduce the burden on the brain center the core network or the nerve area and you do all your fancy stuff in the edge of the network as we like to call it so that you limit this transmission requirement to bring down the overall latency so moving on so the in-house mobile broadband for example oh, one very important point to remember is as you know mobile 5G is not necessarily mobile but it's predominantly mobile on the basis that it's a wireless technology now wireless technologies are very very important because it's very quickly to deploy and get your you know get customers on board so in Sri Lanka the internet actually took off with the launch of 3G in 2007 before that not many people had access to the internet because the fixed service there are there were at that time there were only about 300,000 homes in the whole of Sri Lanka which were connected by copper so that you could get ADSL. Just 300,000 in a population of uh, 21 million. After 3G came in in 2007, we pretty much have everybody with a handset or mobile phone who's connected to the internet. So that was possible because this was a wireless technology. The cost of digging the road and putting fiber into everybody's house is extremely expensive and a wireless technology was needed, needed to combat that and Sri Lanka's su internet success certainly was driven by the mobile industry. Now with five, unfortunate, no, fortunately or unfortunately as people start to enjoy the internet more and more their requirements become a lot higher so they want faster speeds, they want to watch their films on the internet and so on and so forth and therefore the bandwidth requirement is very very high. Now this is where the challenge comes in. How do you deliver such large bandwidths wirelessly 
to the people of Sri Lanka. And that's where 4G did a good job. It's still doing a good job. But with 5G and lower latencies, you need this technology to come in. The second pillar, a little bit more details, is the Internet of Things. So in Mobitel's case, our, our IoT journey started in 2017 when we actually launched narrowband IoT. Now IoT can actually be delivered, uh, can, has two basic categories. One is the high-end, high bandwidth consuming machine-to-machine -machine communications. For example, uh, if you had CCTV camera, CCTV camera is still an IoT device. It's a device what one end which talks to a server and you don't necessarily have to have a human watching that feed 24 hours a day. Now video is somewhat high bandwidth. It needs 3 to 4 megabits per second as it keeps transmitting. Now, on the other hand, there is another a huge, almost uh, 60 to 70 percent of the IoT industry is very low bandwidth consuming, like your smart meter, for example. If you had an electric smart meter at home, it only needs to send one message a month and uh, you know you get your electricity bill automatically generated. Or another important area we've seen it in is in the agriculture sector. So people doing soil moisture analyzer tests or uh, you know flood warning systems etc you don't necessarily have those sensors in areas where there is power available and they don't need very high bandwidth so a simple watch battery is expected to power this IOT network for 10 years so you just put your sensor out in the field and for the next 10 years you don't have to worry about it because the network is managing the power consumption and the usage of these millions and millions of devices so that's the two categories of IOT and our 5G journey began two years ago based on that level of IoT, uh, the, the, the low bandwidth usage of IoT. And the third one obviously is what I was speaking about, it's the ultra reliable and low latency. So the reliability is also very, very important in 5G. If you are using mission critical applications like a surgery or let's say it's the defense forces who are monitoring, you know, uh, in this day and um, recently to Sri Lanka, it's very raw. We've had sort of uh, security threats and you know, people have to have eyes on the ground all the time and monitor the slightest movement of uh, whatever ill intent that's being planned. You need mission critical applications when you coordinate your forces have to happen without the fear of reliability. So for example, if there is a flood and the base station gets wiped out, you can't say, oh, sorry, no data we can't do our, our armed forces can't survive that's that's not going to be acceptable so with 5g we hope to cover the reliability in addition to the low latency in the third pillar which is called sorry which is called ultra reliable low latency communication so typical uh, i mean the the, the well known use use of that's quoted for 5g is actually self driving cars or autonomous cars now i don't see that happening in sri lanka for the next 5 or 6 years at least but the point to remember is there's so much processing happening on the car, you have to have very, very low latency to be enable automated driving because one car has to talk to the other car and you can't have it going all the way back to the brain center and coming out. Sometimes a lot of the processing happens on the car itself and one car may talk to another car to ensure that everything happens on the edge of the network. So some, there are people even talking about the road signs which tell you the speed limit will automatically be sensed by the car just at that point and that would be machine to machine communication and uh, so that the car would know the speed limit it should not exceed as it goes along a certain road. Similar things would be in industrial automation so if you think of a manufacturing plant which is churning out some sort of components you need to monitor the stock you need to make sure that the quality is being maintained and there's no defect in the production line all these sorts of things would have to happen on an ultra reliable and low latent network okay so uh, the third one because this is while not this is now we have done with the three pillars of 5g right so remember enhanced mobile broadband massive iot and ultra reliable low latency communications are the three pillars of 5g now remember I mentioned that 5G is a wireless technology. So to the retail market or the common man on the street, not any of you because you all are engineers, you all know this, communicating on the street wirelessly requires spectrum. Spectrum is just an airwave, but it's actually in street, uh, mobile operators have to obtain a license to utilize a certain airwave. So FM, for example, is used by all the radio operators. Similarly, GSM has a frequency of 900 megahertz. Uh, which is uh, we, the, the levels are indicated here but what the point I want to make is that 
the lower the frequency of operation so if you're working at 900 megahertz the distance or the propagation of that signal is much much further so the advantage is that everybody would like to have a low frequency operation so that you need to deploy as few base stations around the country as possible so these base stations are very very costly they require a lot of civil works you need to have transmission to them and power to them and if you can make the total so let's say you need 1500 or 3000 base stations to cover sri lanka with your 1800 megahertz network you might need only about uh, 70 percent of that to cover it with a 900 megahertz network however there is a trade-off so you can't simply choose the lowest frequency for your operation you need to decide whether you want coverage or you want capacity so one good thing about high frequency transmission is that you can actually get one gigabit per second two gigabits per second 10 gigabit per second bandwidth on that so then as engineers you have to actually make an economic decision on do I have lots of base stations all over the place with a high frequency because people need one gigabit per second or do I go with a high coverage uh, frequency which requires less base stations and more costly but they can't do one gigabit per second they can't transfer their movie files in three seconds but they can basically do their emails and basic functions so there's always a trade-off here with 5G, they have actually, for the first time, identified the millimeter wave of frequencies, which is, you know, in the uh, 24 to 64 gigahertz frequency. It's almost like infrared. It's a bit like your uh, remote control communication, which you don't know. That's sort of close to the infrared range. Uh, millimeter wave, because that's the only frequency that could reliably give you one gigabit per second. Now, the problem with that is that, like I said, you have an access network. So we tend to have our big, uh, actually it's more better illustrated here. So you would use your low frequencies for a basic coverage. And let's say you have a manufacturing plant or something and there you could use your higher frequencies, 3.4 gigahertz or so on and so forth to ensure that at least that area where there's a lot of consumption is catered to with the higher frequencies. Now, the reason I put the access network is the backbone of 5G is, as I said, mobile operators spend 90% of their investment on the network and of the network, a good 80% at least is spent on deploying these base stations all over the country. So choosing the best base station and the frequency of deployment of base stations is very, very important when we go to 5G. So the, what I can tell you is that if and when 5G is ubiquitously rolled out in Sri Lanka, we cannot rely on the existing 4G passive infrastructure only. So the drivers of the 5G network would be the infrastructure. And th there is now an interest, for example, if you're going to have automated driving and automated cars in this country, you would probably need some form of infrastructure from your street lamppost itself. So every lamppost would probably have to be a base station. And while this is a 5G network, remember I told you that the frequency of operation would be in the millimeter range, so 64 gigahertz or so on and so forth. That's no use, even though it's wireless, if it can only transmit about 100 meters or so, it's really not going to help you too much. You, how do you get the bandwidth from that 100 meters beyond back to the brain center if needed? Or how do you still manage the handover from one base station to the other? And actually, that's where fiber plays a big role. So there's no point talking about 5G being wireless in Sri Lanka unless we have very good fiber coverage all over Sri Lanka. So all these parts have to come together to make 5G a, re a real success in Sri Lanka. So the second important part, which is the transmission. Remember I told you the basics of a mobile network, base station, transmission, and then the core network, which is the brain center. So even in 5G, or despite all the buzzwords you will hear, artificial intelligence, NFV, network function virtualization, or et cetera, et cetera, don't, don't get spooked by that, right? It's actually very, very, very simple and uh, that's why I just want to break this mystery down to the bare bones of what a 5G network is and it's just an evolution of what we've done so far but at faster speeds and perhaps a higher granularity. Now <clears throat> with 5G although, you, although it's very simple and in, broken into the three constituent parts, the complexity of the network is very much higher. So when we did 3G or 2 GSM to begin with, we just had a 900 megahertz network with one antenna beaming at 900 megahertz 
and we were good to go. Then we started with 3G, which went at 2100. So on the same base station, we had two different antennas with two BBUs or base broad, uh, broadband units at the bottom of the base station, uh, which was then backhauled over fiber to the network, and you had two of those. With LTE, now you have three, and LTE comes on two different frequencies. It's reusing 1800, which is the GSM. Some people are using 850, some people are using uh, 2600 megahertz. And there is a wide plethora of all these radio access frequencies being used. So the network is very complicated on the access alone. Now imagine you have those three radio access networks. You have your existing core network, which was the basic switch your basic internet routers and now your high speed internet routers. We haven't actually phased out our GSM, right? So GSM came in 25 years ago and it's still running. So on top of the 2G, we are maintaining a 3G network, we are maintaining a 4G network, and now we are maintaining a 5G network, which is like this jack of all trades network and hopefully a master of all the trades it's a network for the network it's connecting every single network together giving you every feature you can possibly dream of and we've got all this complexity to deal with now while we're dealing with this remember the story i told you about the price of bread and a voice call right three rupees ten cents versus thirty we have to still bring the cost down right nobody is going to pay just because you deploy 5g nobody is going to pay you any more for a 5g call not that you would make calls on 5g but you still have all this complexity and staff and power that needs to be power up these base stations all these costs keep adding on and you still have to maintain your costs low enough to make this business wise successful in this country so the only place that you can actually target this is actually in the OPEX, operational expenditure, your staff, maybe are you doing it efficiently there and try to make this as flexible as possible. So if a customer comes and requests a network with a certain quality and a certain speed, you should be able to give it to them virtually immediately over the air. You can't take two to three weeks to process this. It has to happen straight away. And that's what brings us to a big buzzword in 5G, which is called network slicing. So if you take the entire 5G network as the cloud in the middle, people would want it for various different reasons. Someone might want it for agriculture based IoT, which is just less than 100 kilobit per second, one message a month. His network quality requirement is very different to say someone like an entertainment provider. I don't know if many of you are watching, use Netflix, but if you're streaming movies to your device, you need to be guaranteed a pipe for the duration of that movie and it has to be at at least 5 to 6 Mbps. You need to be able to have quality of service to make sure it doesn't buffer. And that quality requirement is very different to the IoT or the agriculture based quality. So for that purpose, we have a concept called network slicing, which means you use the exact same infrastructure, but you def define what a customer requires straight away and give them just that portion of the network for which they are happy. Now with this level of network slicing, I'm sure you're getting the picture that this 5G network is not really for your fast speeds at home, right? This is targeted very much at the enterprises and businesses of this world. So therefore, a business requirement needs to be catered to virtually immediately. And how are you going to give this network to them? Even if let's say Mobitel has put in the best 5G network, we haven't by the way yet, uh, but even if it was there, how do I make that network available to a business? Let's say it's a manufacturing company comes and says, look Mobitel, we need 10 gigabits per second. We need guaranteed bit rate. We don't want it going down. Even if there's a power cut, you need to make sure that this network is up and running because we are running mission critical stuff here. If the network goes down, money is lost. And in, in the health sector, for example, they could even say lives are lost. So you have to take this very seriously. And how are you going to partition this network? at that level of flexibility and speed, speed to deliver actually. And for that, we, there is, this is, uh, you may decide, I mean, for me, this would probably be the boring bit of the lecture, but uh, I don't know how many of you have used uh, Amazon Web Services. So Amazon Web Services is, an, is, a, is a service provided by Amazon. It's on the cloud as they call it. And the concept is that you don't necessarily have to buy your servers or even let's say or simple basis your laptop you just decide i want a machine with say one terabyte of data with uh, five gigahertz processing power and uh, and what and say 
30 or maybe 500 gigabytes of RAM memory. So you, Amazon, you can even do this today. You just go in and from a menu, you select what you want. And this virtual machine is available for, to you. You have the dumb machine, the dumb terminal here, but you use the high bandwidth to get the powerful machine you want and everything happens on the cloud. So that's how Amazon Web Services works. In 5G, we actually believe that that would be the same method of operation when we deliver the 5G network. So a customer need not be approached by a salesperson of a telco. They will decide, I need, a, I need a network. They won't call it a 5G network. They'll just say, I want a network with this level of processing power, this level of availability. Uh, with, I intend to use so much data each month. And they will, in fact, request it via a web portal. And it should be delivered to them straight away, virtually, immediately. Now, how do you do that? Because today in a network, we have this whole processing to go through. You know, you have to first go and get a customer service uh, management function implemented. You need to get approval then from the engineering side to say, can I have this partition in the network? Or am I going to impede on somebody else's bandwidth if I do that? And then what service am I going to run on top of that slice would be the third part. And then you decide, you know, uh, the request for the network services goes one way and the request for uh, activation. So once it's being provisioned, you need to then press a button and say, now this is available to a customer. These are processes that even today take weeks to, to deliver. And if you're talking about giving this to a customer overnight, something has to change drastically in the way the engineers and uh, operators, telco operators, work today to make this a reality. And for that purpose, you would have heard words like virtualization. So what they say is the network is virtualized and you take the slice you want and you deploy it. Now here's a uh, slightly technical point. I'm sorry I have to labor this, but you would have heard uh, words like NFV, network function virtualization as a mandatory requirement for 5G. And this industry is progressing so fast that that was actually true as recent as three to four months ago. But in the time that we've been sort of studying 5G, a newer concept has come in which is called containers. And what that is basically saying is that in the past virtualization meant you buy the basic hardware, you go to Dell or whoever, you buy bare metal as they call it, you stick it in your rack and on top of that you have a host operating system uh, on top of which you will put something like VMware or KVM which is like a, a which is called a hypervisor. And on top of that, you will then put your maybe Windows or Linux operating system, and then you will have the application you're running, whether it's a voice service or a, a billing function or whatever. So you, in fact, when they use virtualization in that point, you actually had to still dimension the network for what power, what processing power do I need? What memory do I need? What storage capacity do I need? And basically all they were doing was bringing this huge amount of uh, their processing capacity into one place and then partitioning it exactly as you would if it was five or six different separate distinct units. So you weren't actually getting the benefit of having this sort of uh, uh, network function. They would say it was efficient and you're, you're, not, you're reducing the wastage of processing power. That was not really happening because whoever was managing say the EPC or the switch says look for my switch to work I need to have uh, this amount, X amount of processing power and I don't care whether it's virtual or not, I'm not releasing this because if something goes wrong, you will jump on my head and say this is wrong. So we were just recreating the distinct or bespoke uh, uh, hardware function on the virtual environment. And that's why this concept changed in the last few months and we now have another concept called containers, which very simply is like breaking down. So let's say you had a device, you bre break it down to the atoms and not just the atoms but to the electrons and protons so that every function you do, whether it's a switching function or a firewall or a database, they have very common constituent pieces that make up this uh, firewall or whatever it is. So the concept with containers is that you have each individual container or piece that makes up your thing uh, separately in a container and you might need hundreds of these to make up a firewall and the idea is that because you do you you've got it down to the smallest constituent part you can actually reuse it very frequently so the moment the firewall is not being used that container is released for somebody else to use so you're not having to hold up and reserve processing power as you would in a typical virtualization
So hopefully the boring bit is done. Uh, so that was the function on that. So now all these things are becoming more and more software driven. This network is now less and less hardware and more and more software. So because you want things to be done overnight in an agile function, the software processors, software engineering processes are coming more and more to the fore in this 5G network. So if I said that we were building a piece of software which was this, which encompassed the rectangle star, so on and so forth, that's just for simplicity. Uh, and let's say you had to do some, let's say this was a billing function, right? And when you did your billing function, you had all these four components that made up what billing does. So if you're going to bill a customer, this is what it would do. Let's say you had to do some maintenance, you would have to ha shut down your entire billing system overnight, typically done in the middle of the night, uh, to make whatever changes and bring the system up again. With containers and this software de defined architecture, you actually are able to now decide in the billing function, is it the authentication part that's going wrong? Is it the data records part? So you just work on that individual component on its own so that you don't disrupt the entire network, make your patch or uh, fix as you call it and bring it back up and keep running. So the network never goes down. That's one of the advantages of this software defined architecture. Now, the, for those of you who are from the software world, software engineers, you will actually understand here that this whole physical infrastructure has actually been brought down to just a piece of code. It's just coding. I'm saying I need this done and that's just a piece of code and the whole infrastructure is now becoming code. And in fact, in the software world, there was a process called DevOps, which already existed. And the reason I brought this up is that the future engineer probably needs to be somewhat software savvy to actually operate and work on a 5G network. This is the way 5G uh, networks are pro uh, moving to. So if you had done bare level physics of modulation formats and studied all that at university, it's probably time to start expanding your horizons and thinking a little bit more about software if you want to work in the telco environment, because this is what's going to happen going forward, particularly when 5G is 100% available in this country. And DevOps is basically a word breaking down development and operations. And the development people or the planners tend to like change. They're constantly fiddling with the network and making changes where operations guys love stability. So this concept is actually a mix of both. So if you remember network slicing, people are constantly requesting slicers and saying, no, I don't want it anymore. That's constant change. And you can't have these rigid styles of stability versus constant change. You need some mix between the two. And that's what DevOps does. So a DevOps engineer is typically someone who would work with developing, testing and the administration side of things and all these actually come to one. So you need to have these skills if you're going to move on to become a 5G engineer, if you like. And again, the, cons, uh, the DevOps operator will be testing and building the product. And there's a lot of automation here. So Bill Gates actually said, if I wanted to get someone to do a job for me, I'll get the laziest person possible to do it for me because the lazy person wouldn't want to keep repeating the job over and over again. He'll come up with a clever way to do this job once and automate it so that if he's ever asked to do it again, the machines would do it. And that's pretty much what we are trying to do here. So the DevOps engineer will write some piece of code, a slice he'll create, and you wouldn't request that slice ever again because it's there, it's archived, it's like a library function. You pull it out and give it to whoever requires it as and when they need. So you go through the build, deploy, plan, plan build, deploy, and operate. And with DevOps, small changes. So even software requires maintenance, right? So there are, as, as those of you who've used Windows, probably used to get in the pop-up saying a patch is available and upgrade is available. Same thing happens even in telco networks. You need to have all these upgrades and patches happening, but you can't be shutting down your network every time you do it. So these small changes can be done through container level style things to make sure that the network reliability or availability is always on, but you're still making constant improvements and progress to the network to ensure that your customer at the end is very, very happy. And these are business customers. These are not retail level customers whom you can take for granted. So, so just some pointers, you know, these are the typical software uh, skills you would require. So if you're in the deploy phase, Docker is a very important piece of software, Amazon Web Services. Uh, if you're in the monitoring phase of your network, you will need uh, Nagios. 
and uh, in the build phase you know SBT, Marvan, those are open source things but you know it might be worth your while just having a look around to see at least what these are about because they're certainly going to become more and more important as we go on and the job role actually for a 5G network uh, will also evolve and there are certain things so there's the evangelist so I see myself as a little bit of an evangelist because I don't want to get down to the bare bones of being a coder but I like to tell people of the advantages of adopting this method and how the efficiencies come because I think well I don't think but this is definitely the way the world is going as far as 5G is concerned and I like to spread the message so that everyone understands what 5G requires and what skill set Sri Lanka needs you know there's going to be a shortage of software engineers to operate these networks there has to be a level of reskilling so I'm trying to create awareness through talks like this to make sure that this country is ready to take on this 5G challenge so we've made a start but there's a lot more work going forward so now the the business part of this thing the third B uh, is you know when 4G came into being the killer application on 4G was speed right so people were used to internet on the phone but it was with 4G when it was almost like opening a tap and you had your data that you could actually get into this whole world of apps so apps have become a business in itself it's a 50 to 100 billion dollar business worldwide if you just look at people developing apps for smartphones so smartphone 4G and the app world was a business opportunity it wasn't there before so similarly I wanted to know what's the killer application or the killer feature for 5G and the answer is I don't know but it's built on the three things I spoke to you before so enhanced mobile broadband where 5G will be available everywhere and I can foresee if you are entrepreneurially inclined in the event that a 5G network is available everywhere actually don't you may not need to wait for an operator to deploy 5G wherever you live so everything tends to be Colombo centric at the moment there is no reason why people can't work from their villages or in their homes if you I don't know wherever it may be out in the sticks as they like to call it uh, because you can take the initiative of building bringing in a small cell getting 5g wholesale from an operator and perhaps reselling so you become a mini ISP for internet service provider to your little village or something so you can buy a small cell plug it in and you're almost like a mini operator these are opportunities that are created by the fact that there is high levels of bandwidth flying around so I want you to be a bit creative in what you think you're going to use going forward because there are business opportunities on that first pillar moving forward second pillar would be the IOT type of communication so we've had lots of interest in the agriculture sector utilities and actually disaster management that's three things that Sri Lanka uh, Mobitel has worked on in Sri Lanka uh, utilities is obviously smart meters so CB waterboard they're all interested in smart meters because they want to give time-based charging prepaid charging perhaps because you know debt collection is a problem and so on and so forth it makes even using these meters you can do a lot of demand analysis so there's a lot of wastage in power generation everybody using it at the same time if you know which area uses uh, your power at what time of the day you can actually make a lot of savings just with that knowledge without having to just buy bigger and bigger generators and build capacity for this country so you're, with that you're just building to the P so uh, a smart grid as they call it would be absolutely fundamentally a pillar of the 5G network with your massive IOT communications the third one would be the low latency and reliability so remember the smart cars or the self-driving cars I told you I didn't see it happening in Sri Lanka in the next five years but if the 5G network was available I'm just thinking creatively there is no reason why we can't create a highway just for automated cars so that you have coverage and low latency on a particular stretch of highway let's take the airport highway for example a parallel road and on that road you only have automated cars going so operators know they need to make sure that there is 5G coverage and capacity only on that stretch and effectively you have created almost like a train service a rail transport service based on 5G using off-the-shelf self-driving cars so the idea we, I want to bring to you today uh, is that while an operator creates uh, produces and gives this country the basic infrastructure the higher levels the application and value add is actually very much a responsibility of everyone in this room and outside you know the business people they are the wealth creators 
this is almost just one part of this entire ecosystem that will make 5G successful. And a little piece going forward, you know, lots of people tend to assume artificial intelligence and AI, AI is another big buzzword, is part of uh, 5G. In fact, I will contend that it's not part of 5G, but it's absolutely complementary to 5G. You can have AI today, you can do AI uh, with your 4G network. What does AI do? Basically, it takes data and data, for example, could come from your basic IoT sensor. So the massive IoT can be feeding lots and lots. Let's say it's a smart meter. Every smart meter is a potential sensor and a potential data point to the electricity board. So they would be getting all this data, but a mass amounts of GBs and GBs of data is of no use unless you can make sense of it. But if you have it in one place, you can identify the relationship between them. When you have the relationship, you can then do some sort of pattern recognition and that gives you from data you move to information to knowledge you are now at the knowledge level from the knowledge level you start making reasoning as to why this is happening and then you get insight and from insight you would then decide you build laws like newton's laws of motion or e equals mc squared you come to a fundamental principle which is what we call wisdom now i believe that ai actually plays a part only up to the pattern recognition. Beyond that, I am absolutely certain or my wish is that humans stay in charge of this part. I do not want machines making decisions on the reasoning and the principles because these things can very quickly go out of control and there is a lot of ethics that has to be built into these artificial intelligence systems that are going forward. So in a 5G context, AI will be used to decide where should I spend my human effort to make this more efficient. So if my network goes down, it might automatically detect, it might automatically pull from the DevOps a script that patches that network and makes it up. So that part, fine, artificial intelligence will complement 5G. Beyond that, in terms of what you would do with 5G from a business or human life enhancement possibility, don't depend on AI to do that, okay? So stay in charge of these things because they can get out of hand very, very quickly. We've seen little bits of it with Facebook and all these social media storm, where you leave everything to the machines and then say, we built this thing and it'll take care of itself. In fact, it doesn't. So today, and this is again more on the business side of things, uh, we've had people approaching us from various sectors, whether it's the health. What tends to happen is that, uh, and this is an actual example, we met uh, a certain person from the agriculture industry and he wanted to have soil moisture analyzers to decide when he would fertilize his network. And he wanted to automate this system and to do that, he basically had to hire a RF engineer and go and buy a off the shelf IoT system which he implemented then he had to have an extra staff to do that another is staff to manage the database and he ended up having a mini IT division when his core expertise was in fact farming he knew what by just sight he could tell this plant required is magnesium deficient or whatever it is and we brought in all this technology supposedly to make his life easier and cheaper but in fact he replaced his laborer on the field, on the estate, with this whole amount of IT white collar workers. And we don't see this model of business sustainable when you go forward with 5G. The concept actually would be that a telco, it may not be Mobitel, there's dialogue and there are the other operators out there. You get together and you build a 5G network for this country. So then the basic infrastructure is in place and if your farmer is there, all he has to do is request via a slice or it need not be a slice, but he could, uh, since slices are hot topics of 5G, I use that example. He could use that to actually complement and stick to his core function. So he understands farming. There is no reason for him to start building expertise and dumping capital expenditure on a network. That's already there. That would be the service that operators provide Sri Lanka. So the concept would be that the value, the core experts stick to what they are good at and the telcos will stick to what they are good at and make sure that this is available for a complementary style of operation. So the techno-economics of this, uh, I have to say, is that the network is actually extremely expensive. I told you 600 million up to date, you could almost double that when we get to true 5G. 
but operators are willing to do that because this is their core business if they don't invest in a 5g network what's the point of a telco operator right you have to bring this technology to people and perversely the return on investment is actually the opposite so networks tend to generate only about five to ten percent of your return but if you are a farmer or if you're in the healthcare and you develop something like e-channeling or whatever by just your software application on top you can actually get returns of over 50 percent and that's fine operators understand this the fact is operators can't do everything we can do only a certain amount and all this value creation actually has to come from everyone else out there and it need not be technical people either and to end with i want to tell you i want to talk a little bit about this uh, real life case study so as the logo says uh, you know what this is it's domino's pizza what do they do they sell pizzas right so in 2009 domino's pizzas they did a survey and they were ranked last for the taste of their pizzas and their share price was at historic low it was cents on the u.s stock market so obviously they decided this was not a sustainable uh, position to be in they had to do something different and the strategic team got together and decided actually what they needed to do was improve the customer operation experience and improve the operations of how they manage this pizza uh, pizza business if you like and they decided that they would go digital by doing this and the second part of the strategic thing was everyone in this company had to get behind this way of going forward so note that nothing in their strategy was based on improving the taste of their pizzas okay so they decided domino's pizza company ranked worst in the taste of pizza decided we are going to turn this business around by going digital and to that effect their chief digital officer in 2012 they had made small changes they uh, digitalized their uh, point of sales machine which happened before 2012 and little things and they were seeing certain improvements to the extent that their digital officer went to the board and said actually Domino's Pizza is not a pizza company anymore we are an e-commerce company who happened to sell pizza and from this story what I find more importantly is that the board agreed now I come from a telco background and many of you in your engineering you probably are aware how many times you had to say fight for investment on what is your core business imagine a company which was making pizzas and distributing pizzas getting all their investment to go digital and the board agreeing i think that is quite futuristic and with 5g i see more and more of this happening but sticking with the story what they did was they created a digital platform for consumers where you could order from anywhere and they 100 percent digitized their operations and they also, because it's a franchise model, reproduce that exact same operational model across all of their franchise-based outlets all over the world. So this transformation actually came from making ordering easier for the customer. So now for Domino's Pizza, and this is absolutely true, you can or you don't have to just pick up a phone and call. You can order via an app, you can order via Twitter, you can use Facebook Messenger, you can order SMS if you have Google at home, Google uh, Home, you can just say, hey Google, order me a Domino's Pizza, it would pick up the order. It would, Amazon Echo, if you have a smartwatch, you could order Domino's Pizza through that. In fact, uh, this is not on the slide, but I heard recently that Ford uh, has come out with a digital car, and while driving from the car itself, and this is part of Ford car, not some application on top of the car, you can order your Domino's Pizza. If you're driving home and you're feeling hungry, from the car itself, you can order directly to Domino's, and the pizza will be at home as you get there with the app they did something because they used artificial intelligence with after a couple of orders they understood what you tend to like and most people their order is very similar so they had what's a zero click ordering system the moment you open the app it comes up and says hey so and so shamel in my case you are going to order a hawaiian pizza this size garlic bread blah 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 and if this is not the order then press cancel otherwise in 10 seconds this order will get processed so you don't even have to go and select from a menu they made ordering that simple and that turned out to be a huge win for them the second one was, was digitizing the operation so from the time you make your order you know exactly what stage your pizza is is it in the oven are they putting the ingredients on it or is it in the delivery phase and for delivery in australia particularly they have started playing around with drones and these automated deliveries they don't have guys on motorbikes going and delivering it this is a little box with wheels which goes along the pavement and goes straight to your house it uses maps it uses intelligence 
and you just put the pizza in it it's heated and it goes so you don't need humans there and now drone control and all that is something where 5g would be very very important because you need that low latency network to ensure that you can control a drone uh, thousands of miles away to ensure that it gets to the customer directly and of course finally they decided that the existing operation was converted to digital and then they used a lot of the AI and analytics and uh, today they actually their marketing pitch is not again about taste or that they have the most cheesiest pizzas what they say is we uh, we have uh, over 70 percent of our orders are digital and their biggest selling point is that more than 50 percent of their staff are data scientists not chefs not cooks nothing like that and they actually take this as their marketing pitch domino's pizza say we are a tech savvy company enjoy our pizzas this is what they go around telling the world so we know the big giants uh, in this digital business facebook fang as they're called facebook amazon apple netflix google Amazon almost a trillion dollar company, Apple was a trillion dollar company but just dropped below a few weeks ago, Netflix is a 150 billion dollar company. So these, these five companies alone are worth well over three trillion or maybe two and a half trillion dollars, right? They control 90% of the digital industry. However, if in 2011 you invested in Domino's stock, you would be actually up here whereas Apple and Google and all are down here. So you would have made so much more return on this tech company uh, who adopted digital as opposed to the big digital companies that come first to mind. So finally, uh, what I wanted to say is that this 5G game is actually an ecosystem. There are so many constituent parts that make it up. The big one would be the network and that is the duty of the operators. So Mobitel has made a commitment that we are going to invest in 5G regardless of the cost. We are going to do this because we believe that this level of digitization will put Sri Lanka on the forefront and at the forefront of the world and actually increase our GDP and make us more, a more prosperous nation. And on the other hand, the parts that Mobitel can't do, we need you. We need you to do the value creation, the downstream work, if you like. You know, we need you to, if you're in healthcare, we need you to come up with the innovative apps that require this so that the doctor can do his med routine medical checkups from home. Or if you're in agriculture, you know, you switch on your fertilizer taps with a click of a button. Our defense forces, they need to think about how they're going to analyze or deploy their troops etc whatever it is you may do based on the analytics that's there but they shouldn't be so the army shouldn't be wasting time trying to build its own rf network all over the country right that part has been provided and it will be secure at the highest level of security so that your defense forces can use this so this is the vision and we are more than 20 percent there so the network part is there there are lots of people in sri lanka itself who are working on the value creation and hopefully within the next two to three years we will see a merging of this to ensure that Sri Lanka is successful and we have a very prominent 5G system. So with that I'd like to say thank you for your time. I hope it was entertaining and you took valuable thoughts back home to make you thinking about how you will deploy a 5G network going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shamil. Uh, it was very informative and descriptive. I mean, we have seen these things in the films, and now it's coming reality. So, I I would like to open up this uh, uh, lecture into uh, your questions. You can ask any question, and uh, Dr. will uh, answer. <coughs> Sorry, I forgot about the question and answer session. So. Yes, there's a question. <laughs> How do you manage competition with the other similar operators? I mean, you are using very, very expensive resources. And if you take that example of the highway to the airport where you have to work really quickly, land force with some sort of a device for hard to drive automatically. Yeah. So if I want to get myself from Mobitel, you have to take up all kinds of devices on the land force and show me dialogue and the other people. Yes. So one thing is the waste of scarce resources, I guess this is how are you good managing competition? Uh, managing competition, that's why in fact in Sri Lanka there are only two, there's only Mobitel and Dialog who are actively pursuing this 
and to a large extent there is a lot of basic infrastructure sharing already going on so dialogue and mobitel and the other operators share their base stations so the biggest cost of the tower the physical metal we tend to share so nobody goes and puts two towers immediately next to each other one person puts it and you share it we try to share as much as we can because it helps both of us uh, going forward actually in other countries 5g has almost become a national initiative where governments push to make this happen because as you correctly pointed out the cost of this deployment is so expensive there isn't room for competition as such because let's say you deploy a network on a highway and a car needs to use only one network right? it doesn't need two of them so that business is virtually gone and that resource is wasted so what might happen is people or operators will start deciding which industry or vertical to partner with so maybe a dialogue will partner with the transport sector, Mobitel might look at the health sector. And it's, it's not necessarily a written agreement, but it might be almost a mutual understanding because it doesn't help either to go and duplicate both of them. Uh, but ultimately, the ideal situation would be to have one network where the services are then created separately for whichever vertical. That, that would be the dream. But I, I, I don't see that happening. It, is, it hasn't even happened in the Western countries, but uh, certainly to a certain extent, Myanmar and countries that started going digital very late understood that there is this wastage of spectrum and all that. And they try to control the operators by saying, look, you do this part, you do that part, and make sure that there is no duplication of this network. So they, if government is strong and had the money to maybe push this further, like in Australia as well is another example, that would be a much better way to go forward. But for now, there is certainly room for at least two players. And uh, yeah, we are, we are finding our way. So even though we've launched and done some testing, there is uh, still a lot of learning on the part of the operators. So like I said, the, even the engineer level, we need to know how to maintain this network. And the demand is still to be analyzed. So it's enterprise grade, but people don't know what the 5G network can do. So that's why we are having sessions like this to make sure that people understand. Good evening. Now, now, the base and the capital outfit for the 5G uh, network planning and everything. You mentioned that uh, the government is not coming in the network uh, operators that are doing dialogue and dialogue. Uh, we have seen this happening in the towers, we have seen this happening in the banking sector, in the ATM. Uh, and then going forward, if the certain industries are shared between the two, would there be a party formation? That's a lot scenario. Uh, because in Sri Lanka, we don't have even the basic things in telecom like uh, number mobility. Right? So in another country, you can take your number and go to any service provider. You are not taken hostage by that telephone operator. So that is a lot that needs to be done in the regulation area. Who is looking at those things at the policy level about the telephone operator? Thank you. Policy level above the telecom operators is conducted by the TRC, the Telecom Regulatory Commission, and ICTA is taking more and more of a role in policy formulation. Now, the situations you described, cartel forming, absolutely, I don't see that happening. If it were, we would have done it by now, and I can guarantee, hand on heart, there is no cartel like working here in Sri Lanka, despite there being two. We are, we are very much. Uh, battle-hardened competitors and we like to put one over the other. I'm sure a dialogue person would say the same thing. Uh, number portability actually, yeah, you, you could argue it would be a good thing, but uh, perhaps the time, Mobitel is certainly neutral to things like number portability. If it comes or doesn't come, we are, we are agnostic, it doesn't matter. But the, if it was to come, the time would have been some at least about six or seven years ago. Uh, and this concept of uh, just uh, anecdotal evidence of something that was said, people love this number that they have. They say you try to get them to change network and they say I've had this number for 20 years, 25 years, whatever. 
but actually nowadays nobody remembers numbers in the old days if you had a fixed phone number i still remember my i know my my number my wife's number and my parents number for memory everything else is on the phone book and i have hundreds of numbers on the phone book so i don't know why people are so attached to that number no your your best friend probably won't know your number for memory so why are you so particular that you take that number with you going forward so there are actual social dynamics around where a lot of the problems can be done and i think uh, the regulators sometimes have a very hard job deciphering where things go uh, but one thing that's uh, that is certain is because of the costs involved in deploying these networks whoever has the capital to deploy such a network actually can end up with a monopoly because if you do this deploy this network and have a three four five year lead time where you've done 5g and learned the nitty gritties of it it'll be very hard for a challenger to come in later and do it so that's why when 5g launched there was a big race between dialogue and mobitel because nobody wants to be seen to be second in this market uh, and that competition hopefully will sustain sri lanka to protect the customer from carteling or exorbitant pricing uh, but yeah, as with everything, the operators can do more and the regulators certainly can do more. There could be light touch regulation. So when the network costs so much, perhaps frequency and things shouldn't be priced as exorbitantly as they are right now, because that's just an added burden on an operator when he's building his business plan. So those are little, little areas that the government could probably take an initiative if they want to make this country digital going forward. How do you think uh, the US ban on one uh, uh, would impact the uh, I was under strict instructions not to get into a political debate. Uh, I certainly have my views. I'm happy to discuss it, not from the podium, but what I will say on a high level is it's not it's not really a technology war, I think my view this is this is not even a mobile view this is my personal view so don't don't sue me don't sue the company you can come after me if you want uh, but yeah so one thing is for sure the chinese in 5g are leading i don't think there's any doubt about that and it's very much a trade war so because this is a network for everything people understand the economic benefits of a 5G network and probably security is being used as a tool to maneuver yourself into an advantageous position when you're behind. Uh, yeah, that's, that's as much as I'm comfortable saying from up here. I'm happy to give you both barrels on a one-to-one -one chat, but yeah, that's, uh, it, it's, not, it's not about the technology, that's for sure. I have a question for you. Yes. Sorry. Ah. So uh, now the 5G, of course, it's, uh, it's actually going to complement IoT and the all the destructive technology. So one important thing which will come into play because there will be so much data which will be generated. So two questions on that. First, how to, uh, from operator's point of view, uh, ensure the security and the privacy of the data. And the second thing, do you see operators or service provider playing a major role in using the data? I mean, uh, there's so much data which is being shared, uh, I mean, making a business option topic. And the other third question would be, it's not related to that, uh, what would be the impact on the use experience? From a client point of view, for me, it's a getting a faster uh, network would be ideal. But other than that, from user's point of view, would the user experience with the operator going to be changed or any uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, so the first question was data and privacy. Yeah, so data and privacy. Let me take that. So actually one of the good things about following a standardized process is actually security is paramount for any operator. And these GSM, whether you take GSM, 3G, UMTS, LTE. The data has never been hacked in transition. It's almost impossible to wirelessly tap in and for me to listen to your phone or something. The hacks always happen at the database end of things. So the vulnerability is actually not the network operation side of things. So even with IoT, if I have a billion devices sending things, 
they are those billion devices would tend to be so dumb that they are just sending a device there isn't a, there isn't much memory or processing on those devices for a hacker to get in and start spreading malicious attacks from that device so on that side of things it's okay the problem is if they tend to spoof the core network or something like that then then you have a problem and for that also i mean because this is our livelihood and our business it's in our interest to ensure that it doesn't get hacked willy-nilly as they say so a lot of work has been done on security in protecting that your second question on using data is a very good point and i have to hold my hand up operators are notoriously bad at using the data so we have lots of data on customers some of it we can't use we are actually quite uh, sri lanka is quite good in privacy regulations actually uh, europe only recently came up with a data privacy act but uh, sri lanka have rules like that the data of customers have to be stored within the uh, geographic location of this country with certain other things so we have even mobile operators have kyc forms right like uh, like your bank does now ba actually mobile operators were doing it long before the banks you could argue that banks should have had that before so uh, they, yeah and reusing that data yes uh, there is a, a recent study i uh, unearthed and it was actually by uh, our competitors axiata in malaysia uh, one of their digital officers did a study and they actually said that the mobile data that people think they call it the new new oil that you can sell this data and make money they said it's over exaggerated on what you can sell to a customer that actually it's not as high as we think but it's under used on the operator itself so we can use this net data ourselves to make our networks better and we don't do that and that improvement was as much as 70 percent according to this report i read so in privacy uh, in usage of data there's a lot of work to be done like i said the operator's expertise is in rolling out networks so it tends to be hard to uh, build new divisions to do this and so the learning curve is quite high so with 5g itself you know we've got to become software focused and all that there's a lot to do there so we are slow and it's a common common uh, negative of operators but sadly that's the truth uh, third question is experience on 5g ah, yeah, user experience so actually like i said 5g the user experience is not necessarily geared towards the individual customer it's not about giving you at least we don't see that as the top priority you getting faster speeds because what would you do with one gigabit per second speed right now even a hd ultra high definition tv stream is only about 20 mbps because uh, yeah, these compression codes and all are so good so but it's more about an experience to a business entity as a whole so if you're a manufacturing entity and you need to make sure that there is no downtime that experience has to be 100 percent guaranteed you know we tend to, we call the five nines 99.999 percent availability which translates to about 18 minutes downtime per year right so that's what we target right now uh, we don't we achieve it most of the time sometimes we don't but it's not noticeable to a retail level customer but if you're working in a hospital or let's say the army or some defense force or even utilities let's say the smart grid the grid is made smart and connected to a network you can't have 18 minutes downtime even if the power goes down you have to have your backup power and all that to make sure it's up so user experience will be defined differently in the 5g world because it's catering to a business so even a low less than sms style messaging service has a user experience that it requires when it transmits on that 31st day of the month the network should be available there the battery power should be there and that experience should be seamless people should notice actually people notice problems people notice a network itself only when there are problems everything's fine like they say about wicket keepers in cricket right you know the wicket keeper is bad only when he drops a catch rest of the time nobody notices so it's the same with the network My name is Andrew Ayala, this is my name. Uh, I'm from Omnicare. Omnicare is a good different development. My question is going to be on the health issues. There has been a recent approval of some health scare because of the frequencies that you are using are going higher and higher. The quality you are in microwave range and now you are going to deeper microwave range. And you are bringing the base stations closer and closer to uh, the people. And the scare is that uh, this might have some sort of 
issue? Yes. Uh, again, why why would an operator knowingly harm its customers? So, if we were to ever knowingly harm someone which with a cancerous thing, that doesn't do any good. It's not a service you can actually sustain, right? Somewhere there'll be a lawsuit and you'll be shut down. So that's why again standards are important. So even though the frequencies get higher and you're closer to the base station, the actual transmit power of that base station is significantly lower because you know that just because you transmit at a very high power, you're not going to go kilometer range, you're going to go meter range. So you can actually fine tune that because your main reason for going to the higher frequency is to get the higher capacity. So for that reason, people so there are, I forget what the exact term is, but per square, square meter, there's a certain allowable radiation that's acceptable the world over, regardless of the frequency. So uh, if, you, if you are within the, and that's why teleco, teleco equipment is regulated even at the customs point. So you can't bring in any equipment with ultra high power. So even if we wanted to cheat and get higher coverage by boosting the power, equipment of that nature, one doesn't exist because it's violating the standards. But if you could do that, you still wouldn't be allowed to bring it into the country because it would get caught at customs. So there are lots of checks and balances in place to make sure that this is not going to harm citizens, right? So ultimately the network is there for the citizens. It's absolutely counterproductive to be killing your citizens. They are your customers. They are the ones who will be paying for you. So why would you ever knowingly take that risk and, you know, be harmful to your to, it's like biting the hand that feeds you. So I, I don't see that as a willful action. Unknowing, there are lots of unknowns. So when you go to hire, why we control the power and all, who knows, two signals might mix and create a dangerous third component of frequency. I'm just speculating, but things like that can happen, which we are not aware of, which may be harmful to the citizens. But as a rule of thumb, absolutely not. And there are safeguards internationally to that. Just one more point, even Wi-Fi, for example, is uh, is guarded on how much power you can, how much your Wi-Fi router can emit, how much power it can emit, because even that's uh, 2.8 gigahertz frequency range. So in that case, you shouldn't have it in your home, but the power is limited to less than 20 watts, which makes it harmless. So I can't turn up Wi-Fi at 2.8 gigahertz, putting a massive amplifier that's illegal and the TRC are actually very good at that even when operators try to do outdoor Wi-Fi they distinguish between the two because the power coming out of an outdoor is higher so even Sri Lanka is good at those checks and balances we don't we don't take health and safety lightly my name is Sandeep Sandeep I'm a marine engineer and uh, yeah for nuclear uh, engineering I used to be used is actually Weapon. Weapons grade radiation. Now, I have here already three. Complement what you are saying. Wireless industry in the USA confesses no study so 5G is safe. I also work for the Food and Agriculture Organization and here is a UN staff member in New York. 5G is war on humanity. The third one, Brussels becomes the first major city to halt 5G due to their defects. I actually have also with me a video, and it is frightening. It is done by a weapon expert who developed 5G technology as a weapon. In fact, that is what is used as a standard. The frequency used in the standard is 5G. Now, the paper thing that can happen, and this is where I, as a member of the Food and Agriculture Organization, we need to devastate our agriculture because it will affect all of these and insects. Have you done any different on this? Yes, to the extent that the IoT use for agriculture is, in fact, not the high frequency. It is the 900 megahertz which is used for GSM. So, if there is a problem uh, with the frequency for agriculture, we would have seen the effects of that over the last 25 years. When you move to the higher frequencies, I understand there is more work to be done. As you said, the standard, I, I think I've seen the same 
report you are referring to. But a stun gun is the intention of what the US are saying there is that it can be weaponized on the frequency range. So it's similar to what I was explaining to the gentleman over here in that you can take a standard telco equipment and you put a power amplifier on it and boost the signal then it's dangerous but telco equipment as it is when it is sold it is sold with the regulation that you cannot exceed these powers so you uh, a malicious person there is always i mean driving a car you can say a car is a weapon we've seen it happen in london bridge in london so uh, while i'm not discrediting what you're saying would you then recommend that we do not pursue 5G? Then 5G is already banned in Brussels. Why? I don't think it's banned in Brussels. Again, this comes to the security question that was posed earlier. I believe that is a trade war more than a technology war. So I'm very happy to be discussing the technology aspects. Hi, yeah, even microwave in your home is cancerous. When yes, it, when it is I don't yes. And, uh, but millions of people do use it and uh, so we should ban microwaves then i suppose of course yeah you see well people, you see now the research says that human beings should be living for 145 years now you know that glyphosate now the big huge problem is glyphosate that was a weapon for agent orange used by the us and that was used then on food and we are now seeing the problem. Why do you think thousands of people have died in uh, Anwarpur and Burma? Like I said, you can take any piece of technology and make it a weapon. It's not just 5G. You could weaponize 2G. You could weaponize your land phone. No, 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 weaponizing. I'm saying uncoordinated, unknown. You see, they did all this. They knew that that was a big thing and still they knew it. Yeah. They are still using glyphosate. And yesterday's newspaper, Dr. Kamal Kamal says that all those people who died in Corona were due to glyphosate, leading from the TS days down to the border in Adolf and Corona. Yes, uh, all I can say is again, we wouldn't willfully kill our customers. Uh, through lack of knowledge, we may, but it's not in our interest to give people cancer. Yeah. My, my opinion is that the one is that every, anything can be used as a weapon people. But the main problem is the who own and who make a decision on it. The technological decision making for the interest of people or operation problem. Is it is the do any? Yes. That that's why the if they for the shareholders profit, then they are not careful. Yes, I, I, I agree with you totally on that. Uh, and yes, I'm, I don't know what more to say. I do agree with you. Uh, profits are, in, are probably important from a company perspective. From an individual perspective, we don't chase that. And like I said, this with 5G, a lot of it is partnerships. So if people aren't keen to exploit the advantages of 5G, that would be a message in itself. You're voting and saying 5G is not needed in this country. And then Mobitel and Dialogue would not go ahead and do 5G. So you, you have the opportunity, if you feel strongly about this, to vote with your money and this thing. So do not then pursue or complain that my speeds are low, I have no coverage here, etc., etc., because the only way we can provide, the only way we know right now of providing it is through these techniques. And we take the responsibility to test it before we deploy it. But if, the, like I said, there is unknown or if you certainly have research to show that this is bad, by all means raise it in the pro appropriate channels because why, what, like I said, why would Mobitel willfully want to harm its subscribers? It's, it's absolutely counterintuitive to anything we do. There would be no profit for the shareholders if our subscribers are boycotting us right so you you can boycott boycotts are a powerful way and uh, the point made earlier by mr sari what vote, vote, yeah what you're doing I'm, I'm i mean i admire what you're doing you need to raise awareness of this and uh, make sure that people are aware that there are risks and let's test it properly and my name is 
Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, it, it gets so at the base station itself. So particularly, I was saying with automated cars, <coughs> if it needs to, uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of video that has to be processed to say that there's a dog running across the road or whatever it is. You don't need to send that information back to a central big brain with processing power to say, oh yes, a dog's running, therefore turn left. So the, if that information was to go back to the central core network, as we call it, and come back out, that latency is too high. So what tends to happen is even the cars themselves tend to come with a lot of onboard processing itself. So it's still a 5G network where it gets a lot of signals and inputs through the 5G, but a lot of the quick decision making tends to be done on the edge or the corner of the network in the car itself so that you don't have these latency effects for mission critical stuff. So, Base you, it can, there are two ways to do this. It can be in a base station itself for, say, for automated driving, almost certainly it would be on the car itself, not on the base station. Uh, on certain other aspects, let's say you're in a manufacturing plant or in a hospital premise, you have what you call network breakout. So you create a mini version of the core, of the core network, just for the hospital only, so that all, everything happens within that little ring fence geo network so that you don't have to bring the signals again many kilometers in and out again and that also increases the reliability so if there is a cut in the fiber your services still run within the building so let's say this building required a lot of uh, processing whatever it is we were doing we would have a mini core network it's a it's basically a blade server you plug in which runs the correct software and everything happens within this so it's like a mini mini mobile network in IESL so MIESL if you like with a server room here and everything happening within this so you're not dependent on the external network so that that would be called edge processing because this is considered the edge of the network so there are problems in the technologies uh, so uh, you said about the benefits of 5G is the low latency one that's affected the latency. So the example you said, okay, the Dominica can move operate forward is now also something like that. Like thousands of kilometers away. So you know that adds 5G latency on top of the 5G latency of the distance. You can separate them like that. So how do the 5G brings in this latency benefit? So actually, in the network diagram, if you notice, compared to 2G and 3G. They don't have that intermediate base station controller or GGSN, which uh, 4G and 5G don't have. So 2G and 3G had it, they don't. So the lot of the latency comes when your signal comes into a router or a hop and it has to be processed and passed on. So if, for example, it was a single fiber with no amplifiers or re-routers in the middle of your network, you, you can still manage your latency to less than one millisecond. The light is three into 10 to the power eight kilometers per second so uh, meters per second so therefore you don't have that uh, if it was just one string of fiber going directly to that place it's okay so how we tend to avoid this is even in the transmission network you try to reduce the number of hops so today a base station here the signal may not be going straight to the core it comes to the next base station as maybe three or four hops before it comes back to our main switch or whatever you like to call that word so in the design phase, you make sure that you limit the number of hops and you try as much as possible to go directly to the base station that requires this low latency only. So that's why things like network slicing is important because say a hospital which requires that, when you slice your network, you will choose a path that's direct to that place only. You wouldn't go through the general internet where it hops from place to place, routed all over and ends up there because that would add latency. And also to say so, Light traveling straight away there is not a problem. If light has to come in, get processed from, I, I don't want to get too technical, layer two, layer three, you know, IPv6 all the way up the layer and then come down again to light and transmit, that is milliseconds of delay introduced. If you're just on light all the way along the fiber to the end and it's processed only once, you can actually achieve these low, less than one millisecond latency. And you want to come to your baby. 
I just wonder, have you done any feasibility study before you implement this network? No. In fact, the feasibility study, the reason we implemented the network is to do the feasibility study. So, uh, we don't have island-wide coverage. We have two test base stations at two locations and we are running, we are running the network to see the neat little bits of what can go wrong, how we can use this network and so on and so forth. So, the feasibility study is ongoing and like I said, 5G standalone has not been standardized yet, but it's important that we don't wait for somebody else to do the feasibility study we want to do it for ourselves so that's why we have started with 5g almost jumping into the deep end as they say because you can't in this highly competitive uh, environment you can't afford to wait you have to go and try it out as you go along okay Okay, thank you. Very, very interesting questions and I'm always glad when there's lots of questions because it shows you're interested in the topic and I've probably made certain aspects of it uh, relevant or understanding to you. So the idea was to demystify 5G. There are no secrets here. It's very simple stuff. People like to use big buzzwords to make themselves Im feel important, but it's actually quite simple. So the questions actually were spot on and thank you very much for that. Thank you, Dr. Shamil. Uh, we have prepared a momentum of appreciation. I would like uh, to invite uh, our senior engineer, Sandhanayaka, to present our momentum of appreciation to Dr. Shamil. Yes, That, uh, I would like to invite our colleague uh, engineer Kumudu uh, Kumuke to deliver a vote of thanks. Uh, I would like uh, to invite uh, because uh, there's a lot of background things happening here, so he will thank you all. Good evening. Uh, Thank you, Ganesh. Uh, I'm here with uh, great pressure to deliver a word of thanks on behalf of the Mechanical Engineering Sectional Committee, Dr. Shami Lapathure, for accepting mm -hmm. our humble invitation and volunteered to share his valuable knowledge and experience with us during his stay in Sri Lanka. I also extend my gratitude to uh, Dr. Apothre's friends and invitees who are present here. Um, there are so many, uh, the main, the important thing I gained from this uh, the lecture, I found some uh, words to uh, the face, the, the meetings with IT people in our day-to-day -day life in my company. Uh, rather than that, uh, the history from 19, uh, during these 30 years, we moved to analog communication to uh, 5G in this year. Uh, and the important uh, areas are uh, the business significance of implementing 5G, uh, not from the telecom perspective view, from the business analysis, there are so many important things we, I have discovered during this lecture. And the, the important thing, uh, the, the lower cost per bit is a very interesting area that I have, because uh, everyone worry about the how much they consume for the data. I think in, in Sri Lanka also, uh, if there is no uh, internet, it will, uh, it's a difficult situation rather than uh, living without water. I think in Australia it's happening because people are very complaining uh, if they lost data in network. Um, Finally, it's a very interesting, uh, very tasty uh, topic the, the, about Domino's Pizza. Um, that's how the 5G and the technology works for selling because they are not developing any uh, techniques to improve their taste of 
pizzas but with the digital uh, the implementation of e-commerce how they success and i also thank to those who uh, raised questions during the last few minutes few uh, last 30 minutes it was very it looks very enthusiastic uh, because uh, there are so many uh, areas uh, revealed especially the human and hazardous side of this uh, technology and uh, my special thanks uh, go to engineer asela pateratna chairman of the mechanical engineer sectional committee for being uh, alive via in isl activities uh, i would like to thank uh, ceo of isl and all of isl staff especially ms ramani ms sanduni ms chamila ms mr kalana mr chamar from IT department and Mr. Tudor, the manager operations for supporting us in organizing this event. Further, I remind uh, with gratitude uh, the mechanical engineering sectional committee colleagues who have strived hard to uh, successfully organize this public lecture. A special word, word of thank goes to all you, all of you. Uh, last but not least, I would like to show my grat gratitude to you, the audience of this public lecture without your participation the le this lecture would not have been success thank you all for being here with in this evening uh, our next lecture the dr ajit rohana kolanna will deliver a public speech on 6th june about military intelligence i think uh, i hope we expect presence of all you with your friends i think it's very uh, timely uh, topic to talk about. Thank you all once again and good night.